Hi, you're listening to Irish Stew, the podcast for the global Irish nation. I'm Martin Nutty, and together with my co-host, John Lee, we're working to bring all the Irish together, whether you're hyphenated or not. We'll be talking to Irish people of excellence about their lives, what they do, their successes and failures, and how they relate to that small green rock off the coast of Europe. If you like what we're doing in this space, please remember to subscribe to Irish Stew, and even better, leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. I'm delighted to have Geoffrey Cobb on the show. Jeff is originally from Armagh in Ireland and is a teacher, historian, journalist, blogger, and most importantly for this show, an author with three books to his name and an upcoming book on Irish New Yorkers. I found the diversity of the Irish experience in New York City, as recounted by Jeff, to be both eye-opening and entertaining. I hope you enjoyed this as much as John and I did. Say hello, John. Martin, uh, good to talk again here on The Stew, the glue that holds the Irish, global Irish nation together. At least that's our aspiration, right? Uh, We've got a big audience to reach out to and a lot of great stories to get to. So uh, I know we've got a good one coming up. So uh, how was the week that was uh, in NYC for you, uh, John? Yeah, it was, you know, actually quite a bit like every other week has been for the last several months. You know, a lot of indoor time, a little uh, mask wearing when we go outside, kind of a high pressure on work this week. But, uh, you know, so good to relax a little conversation here. How about you, Martin? Unfortunately, I think all New Yorkers have basically the answer that you just issued at this point. Yeah. So uh, today on the show, we I'm delighted that we have Jeff Cobb. Jeff is somebody I met a couple of years ago. He is a teacher, a historian, a journalist, a blogger, an author of, I think, three books so far, and now he's got another one on the deck. So I'm delighted to have Jeff on the uh, show. Jeff is from Lorgan in County Armagh. And uh, say hello, Jeff. Hey, thanks for inviting me. So um, I'm going to just kind of start off here because one of the things we try to do on the podcast is get a sense of the trajectory of your life story. So obviously you're from Lorgan and County Armagh, but now you live in New York City. So can you fill in the blanks in between? Well, I've, I've lived much more of my, my life in New York City than Ireland. I left Ireland when I was not fully 18 years of age and uh, I came and did university. Uh, I spent a year in Dallas, Texas, of all places. And couldn't abide it. And uh, I had a relative here who said, well, don't give up on America, come and and try New York City. And uh, I've been in a love affair with New York City ever since. Uh, And then uh, I became a a public school teacher. I teach uh, social studies, English as a second language, and Spanish language uh, in an inner city, um, predominantly African-American high school. But uh, maybe about seven years ago, I became interested in the history of my neighborhood, which is Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, a friend from Belfast encouraged me. He said, well, why don't you write a book about the neighborhood? And I began researching and I, well, I got the bug and I, I haven't lost the bug. So you've been pretty prolific, it seems to me. I, I was just uh, looking at your uh, backlist on Amazon. It looks like three bucks in three years, which is pretty impressive for a guy that's also working full time as a New York City high school teacher. So, well, it'd be more like three three books in five years. But yeah, well, I'm, well the, the only thing I can say is that I feel like that Brooklyn, uh, which could be a city in itself, at one time it was the fourth largest city in the United States. Uh, its history has been neglected. So there's really fertile field to to plow here, and uh, what I, there's still a, a very very strong sense of neighborhood identification, uh, and I've kind of tapped into that. Yeah, I've noticed that in um, your first, I think, three books. Um, 
you did one on, I believe, Peter McGinnis, who is a Greenpoint uh, neighborhood guy. And uh, then you've done one, obviously, on the Havemeyer family who own uh, the sugar business. Uh, it all seems to be clustered in like a really tight neighborhood in what would be considered to be, let's say, by more elite New Yorkers as a marginal neighbors neighborhood. Uh, that, that is no longer the case, obviously. It is certainly no longer the case. And by, by the way, there are million-dollar homes in this marginal area. But, it, it, well, it was, it's got a, got a fascinating history. It was the, the most industrialized uh, part of, of Brooklyn. The rest of, of Brooklyn is quite different. It was really developed as, as bedroom communities. Uh, but this was the center of industrial Brooklyn, and uh, it became a magnet for immigrants because you could get housing and walk to the factory jobs and the area. So the first real wave of immigrants to come in were the Irish, but they were subsequently followed by uh, Polish people and Italian people and Puerto Ricans. And, uh, so it's it's really got a, a fascinating kind of working class history. And I think if any, one person really embodied that, working class spirit. It was Peter McGuinness. Uh, uh, so I found out that he had an archive in Brooklyn College that had never been tapped. So I went and worked through the archive and I think I went through like 20 boxes of, of documents and pieced together his story. Uh, so it was, it was really a labor of love. He was just a charismatic, funny a uh, big-hearted individual, you know, uh, really representative of, of an Irish working class that that's rapidly dying out. Jeff, I you know I don't know too much about uh, Peter McGinnis, but I know he he shared he shared something with an Irishman I was uh, discussing recently uh, that he was a a boxer turned uh, politician and. Um, it, it, uh, an aspect of my past is I was involved with the uh, thoroughbred racing, and I know that John Morrissey was a uh, a former boxer turned poli- uh, turned politician. Uh, he he was the founder of the Saratoga Race Course up upstate, and I just kind of interested that the you know these two larger than life characters had that sort of boxing politician kind of background. Well, it's funny you mention Morrissey because. Uh the book that I'm coming out with, which is entitled The Irish in New York, uh, it's not just uh, the Irish in New York City, it's the Irish in New York State, and Morrissey's one of the characters. So Morrissey comes out of out of Troy, New York, and yeah, he was, he was quite a successful boxer. Uh, and I think it was just something that working class Irish people gravitated to. Uh, McGuinness was a very talented middleweight boxer, but he had one sort of fatal flaw. He actually didn't like to hurt people, which, uh, you know, if you're in a boxing game, you've got to really have that, that killer instinct. Uh, but one of, my, one of my favorite stories, if I could just digress for a second. So uh, Peter, one of his first jobs was in a local lumber yard. And uh, there used to be three masted schooners that would come up the East River and drop off uh, lumber. And uh, there were uh, eight guys who came off one of these schooners and were kind of trying to force him to accept this substandard load of, of, of defective lumber. And one of the guys uh, made, a, had made a fatal mistake. He threw a punch at McGinnis and McGinnis turned and he was just, he was a powerful guy and he knocked five of them out. Boom, 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 boom. And the three who are still left standing realized that maybe f- boxing this guy was not the best thing. And then McGinnis kind of lectured them about about honest uh, honest business practices. That's the way he rolled, you know. So was McGinnis uh, an immigrant, or what's his? No, actually, his uh, his grandparents were also uh, born in America, so they, they were probably they were they were here for a long time. Uh, he was one of, of 14 children, and I believe his parents were born in New Jersey. But again, there was, there was industrial work here. Uh, so his father worked in a, in a brass factory, uh, and he had 14 children. Uh, and uh, Pete, uh, 
he started off as a, as a working class guy working as a stevedore on the waterfront here. And then he became frustrated by the corruption in local politics and, and ran for what was then called alderman, now it'd be city councilman. No one thought that a guy who had finished eighth grade, who spoke Brooklynese English, uh, had a chance of getting elected. But he was a massively charismatic person who really got the working class constituents that he uh, he had and knew how to talk to them. And in a shock, he won the election, defeated the sort of political machine here in in, in Brooklyn, and uh, basically was in power for the next forty years until he died. And a beloved figure. And, and if you know anything about sort of Brooklyn geography, we have a McGuinness Boulevard, which was uh, named in his honor. So I'm kind of interested in your angle. It feels like to me that the books that you have written have obviously a deep attachment to Williamsburg, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn, and Greenpoint, which is a neighborhood in Queens. Did you set out to be, for want of a better word, a micro-historian? No. Uh, so a, a, f- a few years ago, uh, I just started to become interested in the history of my area. As I am a historian, and I just thought, well, I've, I've lived here for, for a number of years now, and I don't know much about about the history of the place. Uh and the only thing I, I, I wish Martin and John is that I had done this 20 years previously because uh, I moved to Greenpoint in 1994. And at the time, there were still 90 years talking about who really had so much history. But I, if I could turn back the clock, God, I would love to sit down and, uh, and, and quiz them. But uh, yeah, so maybe about seven years ago, I just began to to kind of research the history and realized that nobody had written a, a book about about this area, uh, and I saw the area was rapidly changing, and that somebody basically had to kind of preserve the history, write it down because it was going to be lost. Uh, so that was my uh, that was my initial start, and I find that my focus is is increasingly widening. Uh, so I started off with two books about Greenpoint, and then I wrote a book about uh, the Habermeyer family who created uh, for the, the Domino Sugar uh, label, but really uh, set up something called the Sugar Trust, which dominated American sugar. And it was all the story about how uh, that business defined w- Williamsburg and, and North Brooklyn. But uh, what I found was when I when I was writing is that sugar is is not just a local story; it's it's a national story. So I had two people who wrote me from rural Hawaii, for example, who were interested in in the book because Hawaii is a as an area of sugar, and they were just curious where the sugar ended up. Well, uh, so it, 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 that became a much broader story with national implications. And then the latest work that I've done is I just kind of was really interested uh, in the Irish community in New York and in its, its history. Uh, so it's an attempt to to kind of define what the Irish have been over to the 200 years that, that they've really been a presence in New York. Is, uh, is this the book that's, uh, that you're working on right now, you're completing right now? Yep. Uh, so it should be out in the fall. Uh, and... Uh, I'm right now. I'm, I'm proofreading it and working with uh, a man who's helped me with the technical aspects, the pagination, putting in the, the pictures. But um, yeah, it's called it's called the New York Irish, and I I might if I can find a, a, a proper publisher, I might end up you know going that route. But initially, I'm just going to self publish it through through Amazon. Well, t- tell us about some of the, the people you discovered. I mean, who, who, who really, how many people do you write about and who jumped out as a kind of larger than life person or, or who really surprised you the most as you found out more? Well, so I cut it off at, at 60 profiles, uh, though there are two father and son combinations. So it's more or less about, about 64 different people. 
and it's it's really difficult to to kind of per, choose one person because well you know the irish are many things and we're criticized but boring's not one of them and they're just there's so many fascinating characters who come out of new york irish community so it it's difficult to to narrow it down to one but one of many just right off the top of my head is a, a woman called T- Texas Gwynin, who was the queen of speakeasy nightclubs uh, during Prohibition, and just uh, a, a woman who was born in Waco, Texas, came to New York, f- absolutely fell in love with it, and just had this one in a million personality. Uh, she just knew how to get a party started and how to keep a party going and and get everybody engaged and sort of the mobsters who were running the speakeasies realized that this woman was pure gold and they offered her a partnership uh, but uh, you know it, it, she her whole thing was uh, she was the first comic to really insult members of the audience and these people would pay astronomical amounts of money to to drink champagne in her speakeasy and be insulted you know so uh, she's just one person that comes to mind uh, amongst amongst many you know so that she would have been active, I guess, during that speakeasy 1920s prohibition era, right? Right. She started off in vaudeville as as a number of, of actors and personalities in, 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 in the world did. Uh, and then she went out to Hollywood. She made silent films, but uh, she just missed New York. And she really didn't want any part of Los Angeles, couldn't wait to get back here. And it sort of coincided, her return to New York coincided with a, the onset of Prohibition. And, you know, New York has always been a drinking town and, and laws were not going to stop people from, from drinking. And uh, she said she loved Prohibition because she made ungodly amounts of money hosting these uh, parties. And her clubs were continually raided. Uh, but, you know, they, she didn't drink herself, believe it or not. So she was always out sort of the next day. Uh, and they, they, the cops are well paid, uh, but um, you know there's just there's so many wonderful stories sort of you know uh, surround uh, surrounding this woman. One thing comes to mind: evidently, the Prince of Wales one time was was visiting the speakeasy, and the cops raided, so they didn't want the Prince of Wales to get arrested for obvious reasons. So they, they put an apron on him, and when the cop came in, he said that he cleaned the glasses. <laughs> Gotta leave that one in the movie script. Uh, you know, you mentioned ungodly drinking, and before we started the tape rolling here, uh, you talked about the great one, Jackie Gleason. Did, did he make the book? Absolutely. And you know, J- Jackie's from from this part of the world. He's from Bushwick, uh, and well, I, I think a lot of a, a, a lot of Americans know him. I don't know how how well known he would be outside of America. But when you just talk about a natural actor, uh, again, Jackie started in vaudeville. Uh, as a teenager, he was an MC, and he just had one of those incredible personalities. But uh, nobody captured w- the, uh, the working class, average uh, Brooklyn Joe the way that Cleason did. Uh, he did a show with the you might well know, called the Honeymooners uh, in, in the early 1950s. And still, the, it, the, the humor is so timeless that people who are 19 or 20 watch these episodes and they're just, they're side-splitting. He's just, he had a rare, rare gift. And you, you, you mentioned something about uh, Jackie and another great Irish name that has uh, that lived, a guy who lived in New York for a few years, uh, Brendan Behan. Yeah, well, Brent, Brendan was a real character. So uh, I was just relating this, this sort of great yarn. Evidently, uh, it was one of the first intercontinental live television hookups. And it was Jackie Gleason in New York and Brendan Behan in Dublin. And Brandon was, as he often was, sadly, was three sheets to the wind. And Brandon said in a kind of a loud, drunken voice, Jackie, Jackie, can you hear me? And Jackie responded, yes, you're coming over loud and sober, Brandon. 
<laughs> no, I'll just have a, a quick story that related to Brendan B. And one of my, I, I work in public relations, and one of my uh, jobs a few years ago was working with the Lyric Theater of Belfast when they brought over a play called uh, Brendan at the Chelsea, uh, recounting uh, Brendan Behan's uh, time uh, living in the Chelsea Hotel. And we did, there was a performance and we did a talk back after one of the performances. And uh, someone said that, uh, yes, Brendan Behan was the first person ever to appear drunk on American TV. I think it would have been the Jack Parr, essentially the Tonight Show of its day, which was either Jack Parr or Steve Allen at that, at that point. And Malachi McCord, who we were, who we mentioned earlier, was in the audience that night. He put his hand up and said, that is not true. I was the first person <laughs> to appear on American TV. Well, it's funny because uh, Brennan was one of the people that I considered for the book. And yet I, I kind of threw Brennan out because I don't think he's a New Yorker. He loved New York and he spent a lot of time here, but he, I think Martin would agree. He's the quintessential Dubliner. Um, so I really wanted to pick people who were New Yorkers. So when does somebody become a New Yorker? Are you a New Yorker, Jeff? I, I am absolutely a New Yorker. What does that mean exactly? Oh, no, you're, you're, you're asking very difficult questions. Uh, I think it's a kind of a spirit. It's uh, – it, I, I, some of the characters in, that I've researched uh, felt that um, they were New Yorkers the, the, f the second that they stepped foot on the, uh, on the soil of, of the city. One of the people I profile in the book is Thomas Hunter, uh, who founded Hunter College here in New York City. It's part of the City University of New York. And uh, Thomas Hunter is a fascinating story. He comes from, from Northern Ireland, from County Down and uh, was a Protestant but an Irish Republican. And uh, his Republican beliefs were discovered and basically he was thrown out of Ireland and came here. But Hunter said, you know, this, that this moment that he set foot in, in America because of its Republican uh, values, because it was, it was a republic, that he felt that he was an American. Uh, and I think that's sort of the magic of the place, not just for, for Irish people, but uh, for everybody. I mean, you can be a Jewish New Yorker, you can be a Nigerian New Yorker, you can be an Irish New Yorker. Uh, it, it's And it's not something that you have to be born into. Yeah, I've heard um, people when they talk of New York, that if we kind of take a step back and look at the impact of the Dutch in New York, so this is going back to the 1600s, that the Dutch essentially created a totally different city than any other city uh, that grew up in the United States because New York was a city made to make money as opposed to other cities that were, let's say... Religious-based, yes. Religious-based. And that coupling that kind of profit motive along with the notion of if you kind of can just about abide by our laws... We don't really care if you're Jewish. We don't really care if you're Irish. We don't really care if you're uh, Jamaican. As long as you come in here and work hard, you are welcome. And I think that spirit has continued to pervade New York City. Yeah, and I, I would add in a sort of personal note uh, that, especially in small town Ireland, uh, you can be typecast very quickly and people sort of have an idea of what you are because of, of your religion or your grandfather, or who your grandfather was. And there's a, a certain sense of liberating an anonymity here. No one really gives a damn uh, what your religion is. Uh, pro probably for a lot of New Yorkers, they don't give a damn if you're gay or straight, all right? It's can you do the job? Can you follow the laws? Are you a good person? Fine, you're welcome. And I think that that's been one of the things that's, that's attracted Irish people for well over 200 years. But of course, you know, I, I can play devil's advocate there and talk about something like uh, the draft riots in the 1860s and uh, the Irish role involved in that. And that's kind of a black eye where clearly, uh, uh, you know, people of Irish extraction are not behaving well. And uh, it's a grimmer picture. 
Well, it's funny that you mention that, Martin, because uh, I write for something called the New York Irish History Roundtable. And uh, basically, it, it profiles Irish historical figures pretty much the way that I do in my book. And the man who's the editor, I, I absolutely love. He's a dear colleague. Uh, his name is Francis Norton. But uh, Frank does not like to put in people that detract from, let's say, the image of the Irish in New York. And I made a conscious decision to put in uh, villains because I don't think that if you're going to get a, a representative picture of the Irish, if you pick uh, people who are all sterling examples, then it's a skewed or a false picture. And what I tried to do with the, the, the 60 profiles that I have in the book is to give you a sense of, of the, the variety in this community. So uh, one of the people I picked just for devilment as much as anything is Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber. Mm. Uh, again, who's uh, from, from North Brooklyn, uh, grew up in an area that's gone now called Irish Town, right near where the Brooklyn Navy Yard used to be. And, uh, you know, I guess the, the famous quote but with Willie was, a reporter traveled to prison and, and asked him why he robbed banks. And he looked at him and sort of said, blandly, he says, because that's where the money is. <laughs> so but, pretty uh, Irish right there. Yeah. Uh, so it, the, in the, the profiles that I picked, um, I tried to pick people who are, who are not, you know, not all wonderful people. And uh, interesting that you mentioned it, Martin, because one of the people that I, I came across doing research was a guy called John Mullally. And John Mullally still has a park name for him in the Bronx because he was instrumental in getting a, a lot of the, the rural, still rural land in the Bronx in the uh, late 19th century uh, set aside for, as parkland. Uh, but John Mullally also has a history. He was writing for uh, a Catholic newspaper, and he was a vicious racist who basically said that Abraham Lincoln and the war was immoral and that all of these blacks were going to come north and, and push the Irish out of their jobs. And uh, so he's one of, a, of the very dark figures, you know, and I, I imagine that, that that park is going to basically – be renamed because this history's come out. Mm. Uh, you know, I we're talking about some some. You know, I, I like your approach not to kind of whitewash the Irish history. You know, besides the fact that there's so many rascals uh, and rogues that make for great stories that we don't want to eliminate, but we do want to see the whole picture. And of course, they you know they headed their direction in life based on some of the pressures they felt in their lives, and sometimes those pressures and life experiences take people in some pretty bad directions. But I wanted to mention one other Irishman, and um, I don't know if he made your list, but maybe maybe you can put an appendix on, uh, because we we lost a great Irish-American today. Pete Hamill. Pete Hamill, yeah, we lost Pete Hamill, and that'll kind of put a date on when this, this was recorded. But uh, do you have any observations, thoughts, uh, re reflections on an amazing uh, journalist, writer, poet. And well, again, he was from Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Irish. Uh, so I only met Pete once, and he was absolutely gracious, totally down to earth, completely unpretentious. Uh, his parents were from Belfast, as you know. Uh, but I, 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 I think that he really had a – he exuded a pride of, of being a working-class kid from Brooklyn. I never wanted to walk away from from the uh, from the borough and and his roots, and yet uh, he was able to combine that with being a, a very very cosmopolitan person. So uh, yeah, we've we've lost a lot, and, and obviously a talented writer. Hmm. One of the things that really interests me about the Irish immigrant experience to New York, Jeff, is the whole famine era, which is I, I think one whether it's accurate or not, when the bulk of Irish immigrants started showing up in New York City, we have a people essentially from the West Coast of Ireland that are agrarian. 
and then they fetch up in New York City in one of the most densely populated urban areas in the world at that time. What's your take on that? You know, why do the Irish, you know, plunk down in New York City and suddenly transform themselves into a more urban people? Well, I'd like to say that, that uh, you know, we were some of the first refugees in the world. And one of the things is that with the tremendous success that Irish Americans have had, I mean, they're really now deeply integrated into America. They're, they're massively successful. And I, I, there's a tendency among some people to forget how desperate the, the Irish famine refugees were. You know, it was either get on a coffin ship and hope to make it over or, or, or starve. Uh, so one of the people that I, I profile in the book was O'Don- Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, uh, who some people have called the first terrorist, of course. You know, he's a revered figure in Ireland. But the anger of having witnessed the famine, having seen people, you know, starve to death in front of his eyes, never left him. Uh, so for a lot of people, there was no choice, right? They had to come here and they had to adapt. Uh, and the conditions that they lived in were absolutely brutal. You know, they were packed into these tenements, uh, no running water in the tenements, plague, cholera, all kinds of diseases. A number of, of, of people lost hor- horrific amounts of, of, of children right, at a very young age. So they, they were forced to adapt. But uh, one of the other people that I, uh, I profile in the book is Dagger John Hughes. Uh, I'm going to give, also give a, a shout out to a good mate of mine who lives in the neighborhood, Turlow McConnell, who's written a play called Dagger John and His Wars. But, uh, you know, he did incredible things to to help uh, sort of what, what's the word I'm looking for? To help settle the Irish in New York, to educate them, right? To 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 feed them. There were a tremendous number of orphans. They founded orphanages, uh, and within a generation, these people who really came were, were, were un, uneducated, right? On the verge of starvation, uh, adapted in and adapted m- miraculously, you know, and and really. Did amazing things. Mm-hmm. A, num- a number of the people that that I profile in the book are, are famine Irish. Uh, one of whom uh, is Peter Grace, who was the first Catholic Irish Catholic mayor of New York in the eighteen eighties. Now Grace was was from County Cork. Uh, ended up in Peru uh, because, again, as refugees, Irish people went wherever they thought there was a, a ch- you know just a chance to feed yourself. So um, they tried to uh, to form an agricultural community in Peru that didn't work. His father went back to Cork, but Grace eventually uh, became a businessman in Peru, became massively wealthy, moved to New York, and was actually so wealthy that uh, he couldn't be bribed, let's say, and uh, got elected mayor of New York twice and really had a sterling record of, of accomplishment and honesty. Uh, so it's just one of uh, of maybe a dozen famine famine refugees in the book. So I, I just if I can do an aside, I think there are different waves of of, of Irish immigration. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the first wave that I kind of profile were uh, political refugees, the people who were in the United Irishmen, uh, Emmett. Uh, and a guy called James McNevitt, who is the father of American chemistry, who set up the first modern scientific lab in the United States. And these are people largely, I think, largely Protestant, very well educated, the elite of Irish society. And uh, you you realize what an amazing contribution they made to America. But there is this tension, obviously, because of the sectarian conflict in Ireland between Catholic and Protestant that interestingly is for the most part thrown away in America. 
but it, it it's certainly a, an issue. I, I think that the uh, Catholic immigrants of the 1840s and the famine had to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't write about it in this book, but in a previous book, I, I profiled a, a local priest called Father Sylvester Malone, who started a church in, in Williamsburg called St. Peter's and Paul. And literally nativist mobs came with, 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 uh, to burn the church down. And it was only the intercession of, of the local militia that stopped them from, from, from burning this church. There were pitched battles in the streets of Williamsburg between Irish immigrants and uh, uh, nativist mobs. And then Dagger Hughes, who I mentioned before, uh, he famously said that if one uh, Catholic church was touched, that New York would be a second Moscow, that they would, that would burn the city. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's something, again, there's a kind of an amnesia among some Irish Americans. Uh, the Irish were not welcome in New York. Uh, there was a, a real native spirit here that said, we don't like your religion, you're poor, right, and we don't want you. So they, they had to, you know, they had to fight to survive. And that hangover persisted for an extraordinarily long time because you have the first Catholic running for president in the 1920s. Al, Al, Al Smith, who I also profile in my book, and, you know, Al Smith was, was trounced in, in 1928 by Herbert Hoover. And actually, it was probably a good thing because he would have presided over the Great Depression. But Hoover was absolutely, I'm sorry, Smith was absolutely shocked when he began to travel the country campaigning because the Ku Klux Klan would, would show up uh, at his campaign rallies and, and full regalia. Um, and he just realized that, that there was so much animus against uh, an Irish Catholic that he knew before, before the, the, any vote was cast that he didn't have a chance. So I often remark that um, New York isn't really a reflection of the rest of the country. It is a gateway, and it is, in many respects, a global city. It's not really an American city. Uh, what would your take or on that be? Well, it, it's funny. I, I'm married to a Polish-born woman, and uh, when we travel, we always tell people we don't come from the United States. We come from New York. And you're right. It, it, and it's that spirit of, of toleration, that the incredible cosmopolitan genes that are in the very DNA of the city uh, that make it different. Uh, I think there are other islands uh, of cosmopolitanism in in the country, but there's nothing like this, you know. And I like to think that the Irish were part of, of fostering that, uh, that we were the first people that said, no, you can't discriminate against us. Uh, this is not based on, it's not based on religion. Uh, this is a country that's a republic and it's open to, to anybody who's going to be a good citizen. And again, direct referencing John Hughes, that was very much uh, Archbishop Hughes' uh, take that uh, he confronted head on uh, nativism in Philadelphia when he first arrived. Uh, and his message was, no, you know, we're, uh, we've suffered exclusion in Ireland, and I know it, and it shouldn't be part of the, uh, the fabric of American life. But it took a long time to win that, to win that battle. No. And, and now we watch we watch other people. You know, it's it, the, the parallels. Uh, we're watching other other people, other, other ethnicities, other other uh, Americans, and, and new arrivals. You know, kind of fight those same battles now. Yes. One of the concerns and one of the objectives of this particular podcast is to try and improve the relationship and remove some of the tension between the Irish of Ireland and the Irish diaspora. So having grown up, having grown up in Ireland, my experience uh, with Irish Americans was, let's say, one dimensional. And so your uh, 
indicating that it is not just some uh, simple uh, folk that are showing up in Ireland uh, wanting to wear a green Gansey, but there is a, a real richness um, th- that I think uh, your book will probably serve, you know, an excellent purpose in, in revealing. And you know, it, it's funny you mention that, Martin, because I feel that Irish Americans in Ireland are very often the victim of, of, of a very negative stereotype. Mm-hmm. A very un, un, unfair stereotype, and I think that's one of the things that that comes out in this book is, you know, first of all, how massively successful um, the Irish have been in the teeth of adversity, uh, and then uh, just uh, I'm trying to put this into words, uh, how they defy those stereotypes that these these. Stereotypes really don't work. Um, and uh, I, I think so. I, I Part of the way, the approach that I had to the book was to introduce the Irish community in New York to people in Ireland. Um, there's one other sort of point, if I can and make a quick point, is that the Republic of Ireland would not have existed without New York. You have people that I profile in the book like, uh, O'Donovan Rossa and John Devoy, and they were on the ground here, uh, organizing the resistance. Thomas Clark, we mentioned before, and and funding it. You know, it, it, without the, the massive funds that came out of New York City, I don't know that you would have had a, a successful rising in 1916. So I, I think that that's it's one of the other sort of important aspects. Some people say that the 1916 Rising wasn't successful; it was a failure. But I, I guess the subsequent yes, okay, war of uh, Irish independence uh, certainly couldn't have succeeded uh, without a lot of the money that was raised and funneled into Ireland uh, to wage essentially what was the most successful urban guerrilla war in Dublin, and certainly. Uh, rural guerrilla war in the rest of the island. Uh, and Devoy is, you know, interestingly, a guy that is buried in a, in a Glasnevin in Dublin, but lived most of his life in America, essentially as a political refugee. Right. He's very much underrated. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the other things is that um, a, a lot of young Irish people, I, I don't think really know their own history very well. Uh, so this book is is certainly uh, an, an attempt to kind of of, of introduce our younger Irish people to the really significant people who had to spend time here, uh, and significant fig- figures in Irish history. You mentioned before Connolly and Larkin, who are huge. The boy. There is somehow a notion, especially amongst Irish people that a lot of people got on the boat, went to America, and they never came back. And what it turns out when I start poking around that, that is not necessarily the case. And a couple of major Irish historical figures jumped to mind. Uh, Thomas Clark, who was uh, one of the leaders of the 1916 Rising, I believe actually may have lived in Greenpoint, certainly. He certainly did. Yes. Um, and I know James Connolly spent time in uh, New York, the great socialist leader of the Irish uh, uh, of the Irish Revolution and then of course you have Jim Larkin a formidable trade unionist from Armagh I might add yep and he spent uh, uh, I believe uh, at, fetched up in Sing Sing yeah so is there other figures uh, like that or would you like to talk about any of those guys or are they featured in your book? Well, it, it's funny because uh, Thomas Clark actually came up in the first book that I wrote about Greenpoint. Thomas Clark was part of a of a Greenpoint Fenian cell that was trying to bomb the uh, British mainland. And of course, there was a double agent and before they could set off any of their explosives, they were all arrested and, and Thomas Clark... Uh, ended up and did 13 years in prison and, and they really tortured him. It's amazing that he was able to come out, uh, you know, in, not mentally broken. There was another local doctor, a doctor called Dr. Gallagher, who completely lost his mind in prison. And when they let him out, he was a, he was a vegetable. Uh, 
Mm. But anyway, it's so I considered featuring Clark because I think he's an important person. You know that uh, he read the first proclamation declaring the Irish Republic in the general post office. But uh, I made a conscious effort when writing the book to try to include as many women as possible because unfortunately women provide they that provide so many things to keep society going they're they're so vital and yet they don't get the, the the credit that they deserve so when i told the clark story i told it from the perspective of of his uh his wife kathleen and uh, kathleen was uh, from a family of limerick republicans she met clark because her uncle uh john daly had been imprisoned with Clark. And when she first saw Clark, he was a scrawny guy who had just come out of prison. Uh, she wasn't, he wasn't the handsomest bloke, let's put it that way. But when she realized the kind of commitment that he had to Irish republicanism, she fell in love with him and much to the chagrin of her parents, because Clark was fully 20 years older. Uh, she married him. And uh, then they were financially successful here they bought a farm in manorville long island but they always had the intention of going back so they went back to dublin he bought a tobacco shop but it was really cover for his irish republican brotherhood activities and then they they planned the rising and if you can imagine this uh so her her brother and her husband were both arrested uh when the rising collapsed and they were both shot. Uh, so she went to Kilmainan twice to say goodbye once to her husband and to announce to her husband that she was pregnant. The, the, I think the child was stillborn or uh, it was a miscarriage. But, and then another time to say goodbye to her brother. So uh, it, that's one of the stories that I tell. And then you, you mentioned Connolly. Well, I, I, I considered Connolly in the book, but Again, I, I think of Connolly as m not really a New Yorker. I mean, I think of him as a, as a Dubliner. Uh, but one of the people that is absolutely a New Yorker is Mike Quayle, who started the, uh, trans the transport workers. All the subway workers and the bus drivers are in a very powerful union. And in 1966, I believe, Mike Quayle brought New York, I'm sorry, 1969, Mike Quill brought New York to a standstill when he declared a general strike. And he was just a, a fascinating uh, carryman uh, who did a tremendous amount uh, for the union movement, not just in New York City, but nationally. He paid with his life, essentially, from what I understand. Well, yeah, so he, 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 he was arrested and put into prison because uh, he would not tell his members to come back to work. And while in prison, he took a, a heart attack that eventually uh, eventually you know, killed him at an early age. Mm. Uh, Jeff, we were talking about some uh, you know Irish people who head back to Ireland. Uh, do you ever get back to Armagh? Uh, I did for a long time. I, I don't really, I, I don't have any, any immediate family there anymore. Uh, so, you know, no, the, the short answer is uh, no. And in the near future, God, when COVID lifts, I've actually never been to Asia. So I, I'd sort of like to, to travel a, a, a bit further afield in Ireland. I was going to ask you what they think of your Brooklyn accent over there. <laughs> well, uh, it's uh, kind of an interesting question. As we get heading towards uh, wrapping up, I just want to also thank you for mentioning, uh, kind of giving a promo for another episode of Irish Stew, where uh, we're going to have Turlo McConnell as a guest. We, we spoke with him recently, and we'll be uh, having him on uh, along with you in the first group of uh, interviews. Well, yeah, Turlo is a, is a good friend. He was, he's been very, very supportive of, of my fledgling steps as a writer. Uh, and uh, he's just, he's a really, really passionate uh, about sort of chronicling the Irish presence in New York. And I think he's going to be a great guest for your show. So at this point, uh, we have a, a segment on the show that we call a shameless plug. And that's an opportunity for 
you to tell people where exactly do we get acquainted with the work of Jeff Cobb? Is there a, obviously you have a new book coming out? Is that a working title or is that an actual title? Uh, no, so the, I'm going to call it the Irish in New York, and it's again it's profiles of of sixty different uh, different Irish people, uh, starting out with Hercule Mulligan. Who, if any of you, if you're familiar with the play Hamilton, uh, Hercule was a Coleraine tailor uh, who basically convinced Hamilton to become a revolutionary and the rest is history. And then going up, the last two people that I did are, are, are living people. Uh, so I guess for now, the, with, with COVID and the lim- limitations on, on bookstores, probably the place that you can, you can access my writing is, is through Amazon. I am. And you also, do you still blog? And I know you actually uh, do some writing for both the Irish Echo and uh, I think the Irish American magazine. Is Irish yeah, maybe? I write I write for the Echo. I write for Irish America. I, I, uh, I, I, I have been doing some blog. I wrote for a blog here called Green Pointers, but I've really sort of pulled away from that um, to, to focus on writing on this book. So, so that's uh, that's base that's basically it, you know, for now. Uh, okay. Hey, Jeff, really, really great talking with you. I wrote down a lot of names that I want to learn more about. Um, you know, some of the people you mentioned along the way, and uh, you know, I feel like I have some parts of the history of the Irish in America. Uh, you know, some knowledge, but I realize I have a long way to go. So, so great, uh, great hearing your stories. I look forward to reading the book. Yeah, and I think John, it's it's interesting because uh, I don't think that that Irish America is something that that people look at sort of systematically. Uh, you 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 get a lot of things through through osmosis if you grow up. Obviously, you're exposed to some stories, but I think one of the redeeming qualities I hope in the book is that there are a number of stories that you don't know. And one of the things that's really it, it impressed me in this book, if there's one large takeaway, it's the, the, the amazing diversity of talent uh, in this community. So like, I profile, obviously, the things that we do well. We're great writers. We're great actors, uh, musicians. But I also have a bioengineer, an astronaut, uh, obviously, politicians, but uh, academics. Uh, so it's, it, it's really one of the, uh, the, the big takeaways. And also uh, the, the diversity of opinion. So um, politically, you have people from the extreme left uh, who, you know, you had people who were instrumental in the American Communist Party to uh, William Buckley, who's the founder of the American conservative movement. And yet they're all under this sort of broader tent of Irish New York. So uh, I think that's one of the things that is really intriguing if you read the book is, you know, just how, how many different variants there are. And I think when you when you read through the profile, you get a much broader sense of, of, of how much diversity there is in our community. So, John, I really enjoyed that interview. You know what I enjoyed about it? Tell me, Martin. It's the diversity that Jeff presents of the Irish experience in New York. And that is the nature of New York. It is a diverse place. Now, Jeff has written a book that's not a hagiography of the Irish. It's not just about those things that we expect about cops politicians, and churchmen. It's more complex picture than that. It is a much more diverse picture. It's not all good. It's not all bad. And that truly is the nature of life as we know it. But a couple of guys that spring to mind that Jeff mentioned was Thomas Hunter, the founder of Hunter College, which is one of the anchor public universities of New York City. And here's a man from the north of Ireland. He's a Protestant, but he's committed to Republican 
democratic ideas. And then who can resist a name like Hercules Mulligan, <laughs> the tailor for Alexander Hamilton, who is one of George Washington's key spies who basically fed information that ultimately helped the American Revolution succeed. So when we think of the Irish in New York, a lot of people think of the famine in the 1840s, but it's a much, much richer experience than that. And I'm really looking forward to seeing 60 profiles. Really, I uh, can't wait to read it. You know, much, much, uh, much more interesting and, and certainly much more colorful than the, you know, stereotype Irish cop uh you know, background for viewpoint of Irish Irish Americans in New York. Uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed hearing about some of the people that maybe I knew a little bit about, but really didn't know too much about. You know, conversation that ranged from people like the the Rebel Rossa, Texas Guinan. What a great story there! I want to learn more about Texas Guinan. You know, right up to the to the uh, the great one Jackie Gleason. Um, you know, terrific stories there. And then, you know, I mentioned Brendan Bean, and I thought I knew a few Brendan Bean stories, but uh, to hear this brand new story uh, of Brendan Bean and uh, Jackie Gleason uh, together, really great stuff. And then uh, in general, just, you know, I, I loved hearing that sort of micro history that uh, Jeff brought to uh, to his 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 interest. You know, the fact that this one neighborhood, one family, almost down to one building, uh, could produce such a such a rich history and so many uh, so many great things to uh, learn about. So. I really appreciate that kind of microscope he, he put on history. And it's fascinating that a guy from Ireland is the one to ferret out all this history about Greenpoint and some of the people who live there. Thanks for joining us for another Global Irish Nation Conversation. To see what we're stirring up next, follow us on Twitter at Irish Stewcast or like us on Facebook at Irish Stew Podcast. And you're very welcome to join Martin Nutty and me, John Lee, anytime for another serving of Irish Stew. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums, Cahal Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com. <laughs>